One of the many inspirations for what I do with the camera is a brother by the name of Jamel Shabazz, a legendary photographer whose works has not only been published in books, shown in exhibitions, featured in films, and used in editorial magazine projects. What I'm striving to do at this point in my life is just make sure that my history and culture is preserved. Not my history and culture, but the history and culture of our people is preserved for future generations. He is also a righteous man that has serviced the culture in such a prolific way, capturing images of our culture and putting us in a captivating light. His work has captured a time and place that has long since faded. So whenever I get these opportunities to put my work in the institutions, you know, I, I accept it. And it's a number right now. You know, the African American, American Museum, Smithsonian, has a lot of my work right now. The, the Bronx Museum has my work. I went to go see the guards exhibit in the Bronx Museum of Art in the Pilon a few months ago. It is all a reflection of my journey over the past post type of year. So my reflection is pretty much just a, a testimony of the people I met during my travels that I attempted to just add on to, you know, to teach. That's all it's about. People often look at the work and they see the images of, of the, the styles and the poses and things of that nature. But for me personally, it represents all the brothers and sisters I met during my travels who I had a strong desire to teach. So the reflection became uh, evidence of my conversations with people I met. The God has inspired me to document history in my own way and preserve the legacy of our culture. Because we have to think about legacy, you know what I mean? If we return to the essence, what's going to happen with what we have documented over time, you know what right, I mean? Right, right. If you don't have a plan that goes to the curb, well, oftentimes your, your, uh, uh, those, your seeds may not know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. So my objective at this point in my life is to make sure that all of this history and culture is preserved for future generations. I have an abundance of it. And not only am I, yeah, am right. I sharing the reflections, but it's the books, it's the music, it's, it's everything right now because it's so much. Everything, you, this is just a small portion of the research in which I've done. Because I look at it as research now. It's extensive research. Mm. You know, since I came, came into the knowledge at like nine years old, you know, and just starting to see a larger world around me, I just fell in love with knowledge. And I didn't even realize that I had built up an abundance of knowledge through the books that I've collected, my journal writing. It's a lot right now. And it, it's relevant, you know, because there's a lot of information that could be used for future generations. Mm. So I'm just determined right now with this degree to make sure that it's preserved, you know. I mean, did you always look at it as as research in the beginning? I would say so, yeah. because there was a lot of questions I, I I needed to have asked, and nobody was answering my questions. You know, like you know, so much of my journey started with this one book right here, and I speak about it in all of my interviews. And it's it's amazing how this one particular book would change my life. Mm. You know, Black and White America by Leonard Free. Whatever reason. My father had a large library, but this particular book was on our coffee table and it was signed. It wasn't personalized, it was just signed. Mm. And I started going through the pages of this book here and what it did, it introduced me to a world outside my community. Mind you now, I'm about, I'm about nine years old. I'm born years old, so I'm coming mm. into my own. And um, you know what I'm looking at in this book was not being taught in school. So I'm seeing black people, I'm being introduced to Harlem for the very first time. Mm. My first image of the penal institution was this particular photograph right here. Mm. You know what I mean? So, and I'm reading it. Not only I'm looking at the picture, but I'm reading what it's about. And it's talking about a race war. You know, it's a whole new language that I'm, look, I'm looking at in terms of homosexuality, Jim Crow, segregation. I learned about rape for the first time in this book here because a white, a, 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 a sister, a black woman, was raped by, by black men. Excuse mm. me, by white men. So I'm reading, I didn't know what that word rape meant. So I'm going through this entire book and I'm pulling out my dictionary to try to decipher words. And this book introduced me to Harlem. And I never knew who the author, I never knew anything about the author other than he, him writing this book. And as time would progress and I started to embrace photography, my father referred me to this book to study, to develop my eye, my creative eye. And what's so interesting about that, you know, I, I use this book as like a roadmap to show me my photography. And eventually, Leonard Free would die. I never met him. But just recently, a few years ago, I met his wife. And what's so deep about his wife, she printed all of his work. This is a German woman now. She brought me to her home, explained the work to me, explained who her, was, her husband was. We developed a friendship with each other. And for my born day last year, she gave me this photograph right here. Because I told her the impact that her husband's work had on me. 
Mm. And this particular photograph right here, this photograph actually introduced me to the Nation of Islam. It's the very first picture I ever saw of an FOI brother selling a Muhammad Speaks newspaper, I believe in 1963. And what she did, she gave me the original version of this photograph. This is the original picture that mm. was in the book, signed and dated, the original reflection. And this is 1963. And she passed it on to me. So to me, it brought it full circle. But what the book did for me, it wanted me to see, it, it introduced me to what it was to be black and white America. I'm a young seed now, and I wasn't aware of racism. You know, my parents never made knowledge born to me about it. But that one book opened up my eyes at the age of nine years old to the world in which I was about to embark on. And this is another photograph she gave me, which I find to be very interested in the book. And this picture was taken in Harlem. It's called Muscle Boy. And what's unique about this picture for me, as I reference it, is that this book gave me muscles. This book mm. stimulated my brain and helped me to move forward as a young person to understand the life that I was about to engage in. And Leonard Free was a white photographer where he documented black people in Harlem and throughout the South. So it showed me the power of photography and how photography could be used to, to inform and to, to enlighten. And it pretty much put me on, on my path to be where I'm at right now. And your old dad was a... Was a uh... Yeah, my old, my old dad was a photographer. He came of age in, in the 19... He was born in 1935, understanding power. Okay. And um, he learned photography. He, he was born and raised in Brooklyn, Albany Projects, and he went in the military at 17 years old. And it changed his life. You know, he was a photographer. Somehow, I don't know how he did it. We never got a chance to build about it. But at 17, he went into the military when his old Earth died, and he was assigned to a ship that's now a museum on the west side. The, the USS Intrepid. Mm. And I don't know how this black man did it because back in those days, a lot of black men weren't getting jobs like that. So here you are, a, a young man out of Brooklyn, of all places, in a military that's traditionally Southern, and you are a photographer. And your, your task is to document life on the ship. And that experience allowed him to travel throughout the Mediterranean. So the young seed, I remember looking at his reflections of, of, of Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, uh, Germany, you know, through his travels at that young age. So when he returned, you know, back from his time in the service, you know, he tried to um, embark on a photography career. And I believe he met a lot of robots because he wanted to open up a studio and it never happened. But nevertheless, he was always with a camera. And he was known as that photographer, that family photographer, documenting history and culture. Mm. He's no longer here, but I have all of his negatives. So I'm able to mm. revisit his world through his reflections and see his life. And that's a beautiful thing because I look at I look at pictures or reflections as frozen moments in time. So my old dad is gone, but what he saw is here. So now I'm able to throw out these moments and decipher his journey. And, and he would go on to teach me photography. You know, once he saw my interest in it, he directed me to books to read. He had a vast library in his home and I read every single book in his library from photography to massaging to politics. And I'm a young C now. I'm like 15, 16 years old reading it. So a lot of that informed me and put me on the path in which I am. And even my father had art. So I look at the art that I've collected over the years. It was inspired behind him because in our home we had we had art. You know, we had mm. books, we had music. My father was like a scientist. You know, he'd be mm. building model airplanes. He'd be doing crossbow perks, would be drawing. So he was very skilled, you know, but, uh, you know, at the age of 15, my parents divorced and then I kind of like went straight. Mm. So at the stage when I was developing my power, my parents got a divorce and then I kind of like fell victim to the world, you know, cause I had no safety net. And that's why I'm so adamant about trying to help a lot of seeds today because I know what, what a separation can do. Some, some young brothers and sisters don't have parents, period. They were raised in the foster care system. I was fortunate to have parents, but I understand too, that separation and how you can go astray. And when my parents separated, I kind of like, I started to fall victim to the way of the street. Cause I had prior, went to private school, you know, and then when I moved from Red Hook to East Flatbush, that's around the same time my parents divorced. And I kind of fell victim to the streets, you know, drinking alcohol every day, you know, old English, and, uh, and, and two, two things really, two things happened to change my life at that point. And one was my partner, who I was growing up, who was a very, really good brother. And he actually saved my life. My man Winston, he told me about his cousin Cornell, who was a, a representative of the gang, the Badass Stompers, which is a division of the Jolly Stompers in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And um, he brought me to his house one day at 15 years old. And I, I, I'll never forget you know, hearing about this brother, Jolly Stompers at the time was one of the most prominent gangs in Brooklyn. 
And then I went to his home and, and his brother received me. You know, he had a nice little apartment with his mother and in Rutland Plaza. And, and he had these photo albums, like yellow pages, bigger than mine, they were thick. And they had members of the gang in it. And the Jolly Stompers was, to me, it's probably one of the, the flyest gangs that I've ever seen it during that time period. Mm -hmm. It was a combination of African-American and Caribbean brothers. So you saw the British Walkers, the London, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, straddle jackets, you saw the gold teeth. The, that the, uh, uh, combination of cultures came together and formed a unique style. But you know they, you know they weren't building. They they were not builders. You know they they, you know they weren't adding on in that way. But they had a style about them that I admired, and I admired the photographs that he had. They were very powerful images of the gang poles. Because he, really he was more, like, he was more like a builder. He, <laughs> I'll say that he was. He because, was because he was like you know kind of influenced he, you, right? He brought me into his home and he enlightened me. So mm. I saw another side of the game. You know what I mean? Mm. And that was a deep side because that's a good point that you raised because he allowed me into his home, somebody he did not know, and he mm. had no idea the influence that he had on me indirectly through both the music that he was playing and through his photo albums. So that encounter really inspired me to want to be a photographer. And when I left him, I was so inspired because I wanted to take pictures just like that of my people and my surroundings. Because I, I had already saw the power of photography, but I didn't see how I could use it to, you know, I saw the value in looking at photographs and seeing the meaning. But now when looking at his work, of looking at brothers and sisters dressed fly just a few years older than me, it made me want to go out and document um, my community. So I left him and, and I borrowed my mother's little Kodak Instamatic camera mm -hmm. and I started photographing my peers in junior high school. Mm -hmm. And it immediately gave me a voice. It allowed me to open up a third eye. You know, when I looked at the viewfinder, I started to look at life from a very different perspective. And now I got purpose. Around that same time, most of my partners were graffiti artists. So that was a, a big thing. You know, math for everyone in my crew was a graffiti artist, the male and females. Mm -hmm. We had Evil Eyes, we had KO, we had AG, we had uh, uh, La Boy, Taiwan, you know, so they all wrote and I, I wrote for a moment, but that's that wasn't really what I wanted to do. You know, I, you know, I was an artist, but the photography really w w was my foundation. That's what I wanted to do. It gave me purpose. Mm -hmm. It now gave me an opportunity to build with people. It gave me a voice. And uh, back in those old days, you know, we would chip in and buy film and go to the local drugstore and get them processed. And I have those photographs to this day. The very, very important images that I've made early on of my people. And my crew was a very interesting crew because it was a combination of black and Latino. You know, living in East Flatbush, it was a, a mix. Mm. You know, I had partners that were Cuban, uh, uh, Haitian, uh, Puerto Rican, African American, Jamaican. We were all one mix. And we, we all pretty much lived in private houses and we all had fathers. Mm. So do you remember your the very first picture? Yeah, I do. You do? I, I remember some of them, at, at, you know, the role. And um, I ha it's a book being published right now showcasing a lot of those images, but it, it's a deep picture of uh, my partners at junior high school, you know, on this mm. beam. And I don't know where the vision came from, but it's a deep picture. And they on the, the, this, this elevated beam and I'm shooting it from a lower level. And it's like the clouds are in the back and there's three of them. And it's a, it's a really strong photograph that I made early on. And at that point I realized that I got something. And then they gave me a voice. And then something else happened interesting around that same time is that a brother who used to go by the name of Frog, you know, who used to kind of like terrorize the neighborhood. You know, he was a one man army. I met my enlightenment. Now my enlightenment is a very interesting person because as an 85 percent of he was he was a savage in pursuit of happiness. He was a stick up kid, came out of Crown Heights, he was a cold knowledge thing, and he was a straight up savage. His name was Frog and he you know he was a, a brother that came out of Crown Heights and he moved to the area and he used to just, you know, strong arm rob a lot of people mm -hmm. by himself. And he was just known. He's the type of brother who would come to the area uh, like on a Tuesday and tell people tomorrow at, at one o'clock, nobody better be in this park. And nobody would be there because right. he had that type of reputation. Rob right? Mel, my enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And whatever reason he got he got arrested and he went to Spotfoot and Rob Mel got knowledge himself there, you know, at 16 years old. I don't know who taught him, but somebody taught that young man who used to be called Frog because he spoke with this with this. So Frog went to turn to Rob Mel. Yeah, he he, he went okay. to Spotfoot and somebody gave him knowledge itself and then Rob Mel returned back to the neighborhood and he started teaching particular people. Mm. Whatever reason, you know, Rob Mel, his first student's name was Victorious, you know, brother from the neighborhood. And they used to be together all the time. And, you know, Rob Mel saw me and he must have saw a light in me, you know, and he snatched me up from my crew that I was with. You know, because we had there was opposition with Ron Mel and people I used to roll with, mm. major opposition. 
And when he came home as Rommel, he, he would see me with them. And I'm with a lot of people. And whatever reason, his, 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 his radar was on me. Whatever reason. Now I'm with I'm with my crew and we engage in alcohol, smoking, drinking, and acting like savages in pursuit of happiness. And Rommel started to just drop seeds on me every time he saw me. He would acknowledge me. This is a notorious gangster right now. Mm. He's taking time to acknowledge me. He might have been a year, two year, two years older than me. And then how, how old were you about this time? Fifteen. 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 15. I was coming into acknowledging myself on a greater level. And I got the photography, mm -hmm. and now I meet Rommel. So. Um, he rolled up on me one day when I was with them, and I think I had already just finished putting him in currency for a quart of old gold and everything mm -hmm. in between. So we all together in the park. 15, huh? 15, yeah. Because like I said, my parents have, were going through trials and tribulations, mm -hmm. and I'm going astray. And, and, and now, you know, that's what we did between, between the graffiti and engaging in that type of behavior. And we were also like a band too. You know, we, you know, you know, we had brothers, we all had instruments. I had a bass, my partner, you know, uh, Wolf had drums, you know, so we, we had, we, we were formulating a band too. We were pretty much good kids because we came from a house, we had parents. Our parents for the most part were all veterans. Our fathers were veterans. Mm -hmm. So we, we had structure and they used their GI Bill to actually buy, buy homes. Mm -hmm. And, um, but we were falling astray because I think at that time, our parents were trying to figure things out. They were young. So, you know, the streets had a gravitational pull on us at that stage, just typical teenagers. But I remember Rommel rolled up in the park and it might've been, might've been about 15 of us in the park. And he didn't dignify himself to walk towards the whole group. He just rolled up maybe about 75 feet away. And at that time, I took on the name Jamel. I had met a sister who started kind of like giving me nods to self first. She was an earth. Mm. And she, I knew her from my crew. And whatever reason, she got nodded herself first, Sharon. And she started wearing three fourths. So when my parents separated, you know, I, I reconnected with Sharon. And now she's an earth in three fourths and she knew 120. And hmm. she started building with me. And she told me that my name was a slave name. And she broke down history to me. You know, she let me look at her lessons. And I remember what drew me in was uh, I went in her, her lessons, the 140, and it was a, a question. What drew me was. Yeah, the knowledge God, knowledge Bill, knowledge Born, and with the psych degree in the one forty. And what is the meaning of civilization? What is the duty of a civilized person? You know, if a civilized person not perform the duty, what must be done? What is the duty of a civilized person? Mm -hmm. And I was blown away behind that because that allowed me to know that once one is civilized, he has a responsibility and duty. And I'm mm -hmm. young now, and she let me see that. At that same time, I was eating swine. And it's due to Sharon that I stopped eating swine because she told me, you know, the pig was poison. You know, the pig represented poison, the poison in indi indigestible garbage. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and she allowed me to get away from it. So it's really an interesting time for me with my parents divorcing. Because if they didn't divorce, I probably would have never met Sharon. Because when we relocated, you know, I lived around the corner from her. So I would see her period periodically. She would come visit me as a earth. And that's why I fell in love with Earths over the many years because this was a refined sister. She just didn't exist, but she existed with a purpose. And she wheeled me and started educating me and telling me that I wasn't a nigga, I was somebody. So shortly afterwards, I met Ron Mel. So I was already seasoned when he met me. I already knew that the name Jamel was a name I was going to take on. So when I met Ramel, I told him, you know, he's Ramel. So when I said Jamel, it was like, it was, it was no problem. Like, hey, okay. you Jamel. Mm -hmm. But I'll never forget, I was still trying to figure things out between Sharon. She gave me the, she gave me, a, 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 she pointed me in the direction, but I'm still rolling with, with these individuals. And then when Ramel rolled up on me, you know, he started to just deal with me. You know, he, 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 I'll never forget, he rolled up on me. This is the last time I hung out with my crew. And he said to me, yo, Jamel, call me from 75 feet and said, check this out. Life and death has no partnership. You're either going to be with us or you're going to be with them. Mm. And I looked at them. It was just him and Victorious. And I looked at uh, my crew. And everybody was quiet from afar. And, and, I, and I said, you know, I'm going to roll with y'all. Mm. And I'll never forget, we rolled that night. And uh, it was deep science what he did. And, and we, we, we started building about life. When we went to the liquor store, you know, he was able to get somebody to go in and get us a bottle of Bali High Wine. Mm. And we sat and we, we drank the wine together, the three of us, and he just started building about life and purpose to me. And that changed my entire life, my whole view. I no longer wanted to be a savage in the pursuit of happiness. You know what I mean? Because at that stage of my life, I was a fool. I was a bona fide fool, living in the state of triple darkness. I was blind, deaf, and dumb. And when I met Ramel, he wheeled me in, and he pointed me in that direction 
of, of, of having a sense of dignity and pride. And, and I never looked back from that point on. So I'm very grateful to what he did to me. And I had great love for that brother. But it's the sad reality that Ramel couldn't really self save himself. Mm. You know, the gravitational pull of the street was very strong. And, you know, it was diff very challenging for him. You know, he's a knowledge seed brother. He was short. You know what I mean? And, and I don't know the struggle he had. His old dad died when he was younger. So he was still going through trauma himself. Mm -hmm. But he understood the duty of a civilized person. He knew what it was to be a savior. He saved himself. And he had a determination to go out and save other people. And I respect him for that. And I always loved Rob Mel because if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and, and sadly, you know, he was trying to get it together. He went into the Air Force, you know, due to his criminal record, you know, he, he was dismissed from the Air Force. And I think he went into depression because for many of us back in the days, the military served as a way to get away, you know, and just get away from our environment. And Ramel was able to, to pass the test and his wisdom, his earth, she actually went into the Air Force. So he wanted to follow her and build a new life for himself. But, you know, he, he got in, he went through basic training, but his records came back that he had a felony and then he was dismissed from the military. And then he went back into the streets. You know, so when I came home from the military, I would see Ramel and I would just build with him and just kind of like bring him back. Mm -hmm. And those are some of my most fondest moments with him. He's very quiet with me at that point. He was no longer as vocal as he once was. You know, he saw I was a changed person. And I, remember, I have a picture of me teaching him how to play chess. You mm -hmm. know, he would come by my residence, I had my jazz. And we would kind of like build, but I, I realized that Ramel was kind of like, you know, going in another direction. But mm -hmm. I always remembered him and, and, and appreciated him for what he did for me. Sadly, today, Rob Mel is incarcerated. He's up, he's up north. And I, I've written him a, a few times and put gold in his commissary. And I was trying to get him to build, but he, he's, he, he's broken. I think he's been in the peanut most of his life. The last time I saw Rob Mel might have been about 2000. And he had came home. And I was happy that he was home. And somehow... Uh, I, we made contact with each other and I met him at my job and I passed on some gold to him and and I was happy to see the brother but I can tell he was somewhat broken you know that the penile you know really weighed on him but he looked good mm. so I, I gave him some gold which could try to help him get his foundation back and sadly he returned back to the neighborhood and the same people who he saved including his nephews they gave him a package mm. you know what I mean they gave him a package to sell and, and, and Ramel, Ramel went right back. he went right back. He, he, he was on parole and, and he went right back because apparently, you know, and he, he got he got smoked out. And that bothered me because his nephew who he raised, see Ramel was, what was deep about Ramel, he was Haitian. And he came and he, he came into his own at a time when a lot of Haitians were being discriminated against and bullied. You know what I mean? It was a terrible time. You know, people don't really talk about that. They, they mm -hmm. was ashamed because of the poverty in which they came from. You know, people, uh, you know, a lot of Haitians, they hid being Haitian. They said they were Jamaican. Ramel was straight up being Haitian. His mother mm -hmm. spoke fluent uh, uh, Creole. Okay, right. And um, and he put Haitians on the map. He, he made it, he, he, he just gave them strength and encouragement. Because he, he was a leader, a thorough leader in the community for a lot of people. So, you know, when he came home, a lot of those young kids who looked up to Ramel were now in the street dealing his, his family and, and, and they gave him a package and then he fell victim before I knew it Ramel was incarcerated again and it really bothered me because I knew a lot of those brothers that did that to him and I was trying to save him because back then my attitude was we need you Ramel you know we we in trouble as the people and you have that magnetism to make a difference you know what I mean people will listen to you and and he, he you know he heard me out. I don't know how he was in a penal institution because a lot of times you go in and it just changes you for the better or worse and I think that when he was incarcerated, he just wanted to do his time. And he didn't have time for, you know, he, he wasn't the way he, the, the Rob Mel that I knew him to be. Right, right. And, and that was very devastating to me. So I have letters from him now, but there's, I can't get nothing out of him. You know, I'm mean, trying to get him the bill. He's only asking me for money. I want to know, I want to know more about your history. I want to know who was your enlightener. You know, how'd you get nods So He doesn't even go there. So, with that, so that's like, your, that's basically your tree. Yeah, exactly. Your, your tree, but he doesn't want to go. He doesn't want to go there. He, wasn't he doesn't want to go there at all. He just doesn't. He just asks, can you send gold? I know you sent me gold before. Can you send me more gold? And I don't mind sending gold, but I'm just asking you some very vital questions. Okay, that you right. don't want to even, you don't want to add, you don't want to say nothing to me. And I just stopped writing him because it got to that point. And I'm going to, I'm going to send him some more gold, you know, to help him out because he's never coming home. I don't think he's coming home mm. and his, his health has failed. You know, he's had multiple complications with his health over many years. 
due to the diet in the penile institution, which has contributed to diabetes, high blood pressure, and I think he's had a, a number of heart attacks. Hmm. So uh, it's, it's a sad situation that happened with that brother because he was he was a light, you know, and he saved my life. He took me out of, like I said, that state of triple darkness. And if it wasn't for Ramel, I wouldn't be here right now. So, you know, I have to acknowledge him and, and, and his contributions to the community. And I never went back, you know what I mean? Once I got knowledge, so, you know, I never wanted to, to, to be um, uh, in that state. I knew I had a purpose now, a clear purpose to save our people. You know, and uh, in the 1980s was a deep time because I speak about the crack and AIDS epidemic. You know, I came home from the military to, to a time that we didn't know what AIDS was. We look at what's happened today with COVID, but back then, like in 81, AIDS made its introduction and people were dying and nobody really understood it. You know, they, they said it came from Africa, they came from Haiti. There's all these uh, misinterpretations of this strange illness that came out. And, um, and, and so, and I'm, I'm coming trying to sound the alarm because I, I came home, when I was in the military, I had got wind that, you know, the students started dying. The first student died, because, you know, I got out of the cell, and I, and I snatched up my partner, uh, Lamel. And Lamel, me and him were rolling partners. We were trying to save the, the youth in the community. And the ones that we focused on was the, 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 the younger brothers of our crew. So the crew that we roll with, we all had younger brothers. So whatever reason, me and Lamel, we went after the younger ones. So Lamel's student, Divine, was the first one to get murdered. And I heard about him getting murdered when I was in Germany. So he got shot over some, he got shot, I believe, over, over a weapon, some nonsense, maybe sneakers. And then when I came home from the military, my, my student, Naquan, got murdered. You know, and it's crazy because the people who murdered him, I knew him. Whatever reason, he became a gangster. You know, no, there was no safety net. I came home, everybody practically fell victim. And it's important for me to say, there was a turning point for a lot of us in 77 in particular. So that was when you came home, came home in 77? No, 77 is when I went in. At, 70, 77. at, at 77, January 1977, something happened in America that caused a major transformation all over, all over America. Hmm. And that's when the miniseries Roots came on. Right. It came on January 1977. And it was a turning point for a lot of people because it was the first time ever we got a glimpse into the transatlantic slave trade in Africa. Prior to that, we weren't getting any of that knowledge. You know what I mean? We weren't being taught that in school. Due to lessons, we were introduced to it. But now, when it came out in 77 of all years, it created an awakening amongst the people now. You know, people started to look deeper into themselves. Uh, people, a lot of individuals took on African or Arabic names. They changed their dress. They changed their diet. It was this revolution in the sense of consciousness. And a lot of people started to come together as one. And it was going well from January on to July. And then something tragic happened in July. And that was the blackout of 1977, July 13th. Because mm. when the blackout hit, now a lot of stores are being broken into. People are getting jewelry, they're getting glasses, they're getting clothes, they're getting mopeds. And now it created this new division now. Now ju jewelry is being introduced on a massive level. So if you broke into a jewelry store, now you're wearing five rings on every finger. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Now you're wearing all the jewelry. You know what I mean? If you broke into an optical place, now you're wearing the gold frame glasses with no lenses. If you hit up a sneaker store, now you got all these different pair of Pumas and Adidas and mm -hmm. Nikes. And then if, and you might have got lucky and got, got yourself a weapon. Mm -hmm. So now you got, you got all that going on. Now you got those that have and those that don't have. So now people see you that there. Now you got the jury. Now the envy and jealousy is there. And now now the violence starts to ensue. You know, the envy and jealousy start to become very uh, normalized. Was that the uh, same uh, blackout where that is credited for uh, people getting hip hop equipment? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, and, right. and that's what that did too, because now, you know, those DJs, now you you were able to get better equipment now. You got your turntables, you got your records, you got your speakers, and that helped to kind of like give birth to hip hop on an even greater level now because that's what people got. People went ballistic when the blackout hit. For me, I stayed home because I was preparing to go into the military. So, you know, I needed to be home. So I thought about it. My parents hit the boss, and luckily I moved from my neighborhood into another area with my mother, and I stayed home that night because I was prepping to go into the army. You know, so that saved me because if it didn't, I would have been there, right there with them. And a lot of people got arrested, some people got hurt, 
I remember Wise got his, his leg almost amputated by, mm. you know, some glass fell on him. And I'm glad that I stayed. You know, me and my man Lamel stayed. At the degree of knowledge God, you know, I went into the military and then I went to Germany. And then later on in August, we would go into the military. You know, we would get away, we would go to our, our basic training, and then we would be shipped over after um, infantry school over to Germany. And that saved us because what happened in Germany is like time froze for us. We now in a very different environment and we have to figure out life on our own. You know, we have to utilize all our teaching and training to survive the hardships mm -hmm. of this new journey in our lives. And that was our challenge. So I met went one direction, I went another direction. And we just, you know, we, we, we just had to navigate through that. And, you know, for me, I use it as an opportunity to ele ele elevate myself. Because I left school early. With my parents divorced and no safe safety net being there, the recruiter came up to the school and he sold us a dream. You know, he promised us more gold for our labor. Mm -hmm. And it was a good thing because if he didn't do that, I don't know where we would have been. So I encouraged Lamel to join with me and we did. And, um, you know, we made it work. My attitude was I'm going to leave school early, but I'm going to finish school in the, in the military and I'm going to go to college. I'm going to get all of what I can. And I did. And that was my main objective. So in this case, you made sure you got the gold. Yes, yeah, exactly. And I did. I got, I got the gold and some. But it was a very interesting experience going overseas to Germany at that time because there was a heroin, a heroin epidemic over there. You know, her Amsterdam was close to Germany, so a lot of soldiers and civilians alike would go to Amsterdam and get drugs. And it had a major drug problem between heroin, hash, mandrakes, you know, liquid speed, mm. tie stick, everything was over there. So it was a major problem amongst young soldiers. I remember my first month over there, you know, a number of people were ODing off of heroin, you know, so it was a serious time. I'm luckily, I'm, I'm fortunate to have gotten saved because a brother who didn't smoke and drink snatched me up and put me under the wing and started giving me guidance. He's a brother I'm tight with to this very day. I owe my life to him because he was about working out and studying. Mm -hmm. And in my unit, practically everybody got high, you know, every drug was there. You know, if I would have stayed in that atmosphere, I would have definitely felt great because I was young, and um, and that's just what people did at that time. So was that brother a five percent as well? No, he wasn't. He wasn't. He was just he was just a wild brother from mm. from Staten Island that was wild. Mm. He was out of control, and he went in young too. You know, to escape. He was interested with his journey because he was going on the buddy system, buddy the buddy system with his partner. His partner got murdered right before they joined. So I'm just finding that out later on that he came in with trauma. You know, so a lot of us came in with trauma. You know, many people who join the military, some people come from foster care, violent backgrounds. They just, it's just a form of escape for a lot of us, you know, just to get away. Luckily, the war in Vietnam had just ended, so we didn't have to go to war. You know, my father never wanted me to go because he saw what war did. And I was naive. We were all naive. We, we didn't think about war at that time. But if it was a few years earlier, Vietnam would have been going and we, you know, our lives would have been different. I would not have joined if there was a war going on, you know. Mm -hmm. I was very, I guess it was a great time for us because the war ended in 75 and we went in 77. Mm -hmm. So America was recovering from a war. So it was a, a good time to be in, you know, so. Um, when I came home from the military, you know, I, I sensed something bad was going to happen. That experience prepared me to come home back to the world. And when we came back, I came home to a war zone. You know, when I think about coming home, I think about a lot. This is one of the first brothers I met when I came home. I reconnected with. And this is my man, Carol, who lived around the corner from me. And I would see Carol and we would build. And I liked the brother. He was a few years younger than me. And we would build about life. Unbeknownst to me, Carol was a gangster. You know what I mean? He, I, I find out now he shot up to school earlier, you know, and he had beef with a lot of people. Well, I didn't even know that. I just saw a good young brother. I mean, it's the layers behind who his brother is phenomenal. You know, it, it, it's, he's loved by some and hated by many, but I just saw a good brother. I looked beyond the reputation. I looked at a good person. And this picture was taken in what year? This particular picture was taken around 82, 83. Right. I met him, I met him in 80. I reconnected with him in 80. I came home to war now, because he's at war with a lot of brothers I know. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about this picture, a lot of young people knew me, you know, and they all embraced me, but unbeknownst to me, just a few months earlier, they were all at war with each other. They had major wars with each other going on, and they were still active. So I had new other brothers, when I would travel to reconnect myself in the community, there's 
brothers I would roll with later on, and unbeknownst to me, they were shooting at each other just a few months early. They were arch enemies to each other. And I'm building with all these different groups, and I'm building with another group of brothers. You know, like the guards I was building with later on in the evening would come visit me, and then they mentioned to me that, you know, one of the brothers' sister was gang raped. Mm. And now they want to enact justice. And this happened, you know, I just came home to this. And I, and I knew the brother, and i like, this is what you brothers want to do. Let's go and act justice. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, you know, being with these brothers and agreeing to go look for the people that did it. And they mentioned their names. The names weren't familiar to me at all. So it's interesting that, you know, when we rolled up at this party, they say, there, there they go. And these brothers was locked and loaded. And I'm looking at these brothers, and I said, we can't do this. I know those brothers. These the, the brothers that they wanted to take out were brothers I knew who I used to hang out with earlier, mm -hmm. younger brothers that were good brothers to me, and they wanted to kill them. And I told these brothers we can't. They said we're not going to get another chance. We got to do this right now. I said y'all can't do this. I know these brothers. They said yo, we got to do this. We may not do it. We get another opportunity. And I told the brothers we can't do it. And I called it off. Mm. And then I, I went and I talked to the brothers about it later on, and they told me that it, it, it didn't happen that way. It was it was a misinterpretation. But my point, and what was interesting about the brothers they want to kill, they had beef with Carol. So you got these three different scenarios going on. Carol got beat with these two brothers that were accused of rape. The other brothers I know who I roll with at night got beat with the two with these two brothers, and three groups want to kill each other. And at that point, I realized there's a problem here. Something something went drastically wrong. Where there is no love, there's separation, there's hatred, and we got to put this to an end. And I wanted no part of none of that. All I wanted to do was be a light and figure out what went wrong. And the whole neighborhood scene that had just gone astray. All the brothers I knew went astray. Another thing I remember the first party I went through, and I reconnected with a lot of my old partners in this book. And I had to put this picture in here because this is the party I went through. And I didn't even realize, this is my man Shabazz, he had just got mm. shot a few months earlier. Mm. You know what I mean? And then everybody else ended up going to the penal institution. So this is a partner I grew up with in the 70s. And now I'm coming home and he had just got shot, I believe, the spring of 1980. And I came home in the summer of 1980. So I'm coming home to all of this war and all this confusion, all of this death and destruction. And nobody's teaching civilization. It's like, what happened? What happened to, to brothers saying, you know, you know, wanting to be lights? Everybody now got nicknames. You know what I mean? They went from having righteous names to now this is Shah, this is this name, that name. And brothers is all engaged in just 10% behavior. You know, they just want to get rich. And I couldn't believe it. You know, one of the brothers who gave me my first dark room, you know, was a brother in our cipher. And he gave me his, his enlarger. And I guess he traded it for scales because he went on to sell cocaine. Mm. You know, so everybody had changed, and nobody. You know, I'm looking around; nobody's really building. Like, what happened? You know what I mean? It's just changed overnight. So, what do you think it was that that made brothers want to go from the five percent to the ten percent? Money, mm. money, greed, power, mm. a forced sense of power. People wanted had that illusion of just wanting money, and it became it became their god. Mm. And I didn't understand that. You know what I mean? So I'm working in overtime trying to save the young brothers, you know, going back up to the high schools and reminding them. So the images I took became a, a part of my, what I call visual medicine, to help aid the people in, in better understanding what's going on in our cycle. You know, for me now, the photography, this is when the photography came into play because the camera became the magnet that drew a lot of people to me. And at the same time, it provided me with an opportunity to build with people I didn't know. You know, I could roll up and introduce myself. It first started with people I knew, because I went back to my high school, and a lot of the kids that were going to school at that time, the young people, they were the little brothers and sisters of the people I knew, or they lived in my neighborhood. So I became like a big brother to a lot of them. And when I went and told them, I'm just back on the scene, you know, I, I always mirror Marvin Gaye's song, What's Happening, Brother, to what it was, the, 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 the vibration I'm on, because I'm back in the world, and I'm trying to engage people about life and what's going on, my experience of what happened. And we got to be mindful of the time. For, for me, at this point in, my, in time, I'm just trying to archive what I've captured over the years. I have, I got millions of photographs. Because back in the days when I was in the army, the Ku Klux Klan used to say, you know, in 1984, the blacks would be no more. So I really believe that there's going to be racial conflict in America in, in 1984. And even the book 1984 by George Orwell spoke about this change in society 
and uh, and I realized that what they actually meant was the change was Ronald Reagan become president. Mm. Because when Ronald Reagan became president and the crack epidemic came into into fruition, there was a new war that was going on. There was a genocide that was taking place. Uh, you know, the crack came into our communities and transformed people overnight. You know, sisters that were on their way to college now had fallen victim to, to addiction. Uh, young brothers that were on their way to college or in college, they, they, they made conscious choices and wanted to sell drugs. You know, because that, that money behind crack was so good for a lot of them. And then the high was good for other people. So crack was a perfect instrument that was used to really destroy people. And I witnessed that in real time. And I'm looking at it and I'm devastated behind what it's doing. Now people are falling the victim to it. And I understood it because I saw what heroin did and when I was in the military and now I'm looking at what crack is doing in our community. And so many people started falling victim to it. Mm-hmm. And then now Ronald Reagan becomes president and now he enacts a war on drugs. And we know what that meant. You know, now you have mass arrests and you have people who needed rehabilitation versus incarceration, and now it's this big dragnet just pulling everybody in, mm. and people falling victim to it, you know what I mean? It was just really a tragedy to see that. But prior to that, or around the same time, I'll say before that, you know, what happens when you come home from the service, you know, uh, our fathers, many of them worked for the city, you know, so they told us it's good to have a foundation to get a good city job, apply for all the examinations. So that's what I did, I applied for a wide range of jobs for the city and then that's when corrections called me Mm -hmm. and I realized that this is my assignment now you know I need to go here because this is where our people are at and this is in 84? this is in 83 83 right so that's when you got so in 83 you know I decided to make that move but prior to becoming a correction officer I had already done extensive research on the penal institution you know from studying the Attica riots uh, studying the prison letters of George Jackson Solidar brothers, you know, um, looking at Malcolm X's history of being incarcerated and Mandela being incarcerated, Malcolm, um, um, Martin King being incarcerated. So I knew that, you know, inside the penal institution was the place to be to try to save our people. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that was a deep assignment because I, I view it as an assignment in life, you know, that I had to go deep into the belly of the beast to try to reach our people. And I had, I had partners that was incarcerated that were hit with 25 of life. So I came home and they got hit up back in 79, they weren't never coming home. Mm-hmm. And I had other associates that had just came home from the penal institution. Do the social media now and find out more and more about people I rode with. You know, they keep telling me a deeper history. And I didn't realize that some brothers that I had reconnected with in the early 80s had just came home from the penal, just came home fresh. And it's through my conversations with them that I realized that there's a lot of innocent people locked up. And then there's, there's some who, who made bad decisions in their life. I was wondering, I, I luckily did, my path was very different because I could have easily been right there. You know, but I think that I was being groomed for a higher calling in life and I didn't go. Instead, I went in as an officer. So and, you, encou- you encountered a lot of your air like. Oh, no and, doubt, yeah. And, and yeah. What, was, what was that like? It was shocking, you know, because it's like when the first one I got there was so many people that were there. I knew, I knew so many people that were locked up. It's like, now I know why I haven't seen you before because you're here. Mm. You know, and I was, I was on Rikers Island and it, it just blew me away to see all these healthy, strong individuals that were behind bars. And then what it did to them, because now it's survival of the fittest, fittest, innocent or guilty. You have to survive now in this harsh condition, this very violent, hateful atmosphere. You have to survive. And I remember the first place I worked at was the Bing. You know, and then I saw my man Shy, and I met some good brothers up in there that I knew. Good, strong brothers that were locked up. And my whole thing with them is like, all right, y'all brothers is here, but don't forget your duty and responsibility. You know what I mean? You're here, this is the perfect, it, 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 it's, this is the ideal place to be to, to, to educate people. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because everyone's here, you can't go nowhere. But it wasn't that easy. It sounded good, but it just wasn't that easy because it's survival of the fittest right now. You have to survive up in here. You know what I'm saying? They hear, heard what I'm saying, and they did the best they could to survive, but it's still a grimy atmosphere. And at that time, it was a horrible war going on between the blacks and Latinos. At that time, they called them Germans. And it was sad, because I came from a community that we were, we were all one, you know, coming from Red Hook. You know, we didn't look at color. You know what I mean? And my part, my associates were, were, were different color, but now in the P now, it's this divide now between the different cultures. You know what I mean? And you got 
houses they call German houses. You got gods, you got gods and houses, you got all these different mixes, and everybody's just trying to survive. And it's a horrible, horrible atmosphere. The slashings, the stabbings, the individuals who can't deal with it, so they want to kill themselves. You know what I mean? All that's inside there. And it was it's just a, a very hateful atmosphere. I went in there with the determination to try to do the best I can to save as many people as I could. And you're dealing with the valley and the shadow of death every day. You're dealing with people who hate you because you wear that uniform. You got people who wear the uniform who hate you because you're black. They hate you because you might refer to inmates, deal with them with, on a level of humanity. So you got to deal with all these obstacles every single day. You know, for me to find balance, I had to read the art of war and the art of peace. You know, to kind of like deal with that atmosphere every single day. You know, and it's the photography that was the therapy for me because, you know, I went in there, you know, and first of all, I was bringing reflections inside to show individuals what freedom was, to remind them of, of what freedom okay. was. So your photography was still prevalent at the, during this time. Yeah. While you, and you never put that down. Never, never. It, it, it was even more prevalent now because now I got, now I got to work overtime to warn people in the street of what I'm seeing in the penal institution. Because I'm seeing a lot of stuff in the penal institution. And mind you now, there's a lot of young brothers in the street that feel that the penal institution is gladiator school. And they feel that they need to go there as a form of a rite of passage. Mm -hmm. So so they want to go now. And I, I'm trying to convince brothers that that's not the place to be. You know what I mean? You ain't got to prove yourself that you can solve the penal by getting locked up. Because it ain't like that. You know, and there's a lot of people that felt that way until you get in there. You know, so I'm trying to, to use my platform to inform people of the horrors of the penal institution. I'm leaving Rikers Island, I'm going downtown Brooklyn in front of Albee Square Mall. You know, to me that was a nucleus where people came together, you know, from the different sections of Medina to, to congregate. And I'm using that platform to let people know what I did. You know, in some, in some cases I'm letting people know, yo, I, this is what I do. Then there's others that got released and they would see me. Cause you know, I'm from Medina and I would spend a lot of time at the head of Medina, a place we call Albi Square Mall, like almost every day, that was the nucleus where everybody was at. Like I remember, you know, 50 Cent, you know, Shami in mm -hmm. front of Albi Square Mall. I remember him in the penal institution. The original in 50 Cent. Yeah, the original, mm -hmm. you know. I knew him in Shami. I didn't know him as 50 Cent at that time. He was just a young brother, you know, who had a lot of energy that was in the military. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, he oh, just... He was in the military. Yeah, he went into the army. Okay. You know, I believe it, it might have been the National Guard, but he was able to go through basic training. And that's how we connected because he had that knowledge. Mm -hmm. But, you know, more than likely, they might have realized that he had a record. And then they, they told him that he, had, that he got dismissed like Rob Mel. Because, you know, the, uh, the head of Medina, downtown Brooklyn, you got everybody there. You got Marcy, you got Tompkins, you got Bree Boys, you got Brownsville, you got... Everybody emerges there, especially during the weekday, and it's a lot of tension. But, but and I'm right there in front of the album square more practically every single day, taking photographs of almost everybody. But a lot of brothers would be in front of the mall. For me, as a righteous man, that was a place to be because it allowed me to connect with people from all over Brooklyn, you know, in that one space. And that's where a lot of my photographs came from, right from the heart of downtown Brooklyn. And um, and I try to warn people of the dangers of it, but that crack was in motion. And people get money and you know and it just drew a lot of people in and I would go, go in the penal and show the reflection in, tr in, in hopes of trying to, to guide people on a better path but it was challenging you know it was a very negative atmosphere because they make you savage up in there you know you work in an area where you have 60 inmates 30 on each side and it's survival of the fittest people get robbed you know you know uh, you know you got people who can't get out because of the high bells it's a lot going on. You got individuals being vicked. You know, now you're being made, you know, made tag to wash people's underwear. Mm. And it really bothered me. It's like, why are you doing this to this person? You know what I mean? Just wash your own underwear. Why would you dehumanize this person like this here? Because he's weak. You know, mm. so people get robbed for their sneakers, you know. And just horrible things happen, you know. Even brothers in which I was trying to build with, you know, trying to enlighten. You know, I remember one brother in particular, you know, who I used to build with all the time in there. He used to tell him about his old dad and their relationship. And I remember, you know, the day that his old dad died. And I think it was me that had to tell him. Or somehow I was affiliated mm. with his brother dying. Maybe he got a phone call and found out that his father died. And I'm there with him, kind of like comfort the brother. And I remember sitting in the cell with him as he was crying. And then I left. And then he took out a razor. And he just sliced this dude's face wide open mm. to get out his frustration. You know, and it really bothered me, you know, seeing, you know, that type of violence inside there and, 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 and 
with how we dehumanize each other. And like I said, kids, they can't take it no more. They want to kill themselves, you know, because it's so violent in there. And, and, and going back to the wars between the blacks and Latinos, one of the things that I realized in order to survive in there and to be effective that I had to work with a Latino partner. So throughout my entire career, I always wanted a Latino partner with me to produce a balance. Someone who spoke the language, who understood the culture. Even for me, you know, I wanted to show that I was, I empathized, you know, and I, so I went to Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic. I went to parades and community to learn more about the culture. I understood the music and how important it was. And because a lot of times fights would develop over the phone, over the TV. You might, you want to watch the program, they want to watch the program. You got dudes that don't speak English, so they want to watch the Spanish channel. So the, there was fights and stabbers over the TV. Where there needs to be a balance of mutual respect. Now, I'm, I'm doing adolescents now, mind you. The adults were different. Adolescents, they weren't fully developed, so they had that war mentality. And a, a, lot of, a lot of people got hurt. And it, it really bothered me, you know. As I matured, you know, I understood that balance. <laughs> where, you know, half the day, one portion day could be listening, spent listening to 98.7 Kiss. And the other, another portion they could be spent listening to the, to the Latino radio station because they needed that to hear music from their culture and to get news in their language. So I, I was able to create that system to produce that balance. But those wars ensued for a long time. And then as the 90s progressed, then the gang culture came. The Latin Kings, the Bloods, and then they went at it. was a whole nother war that started to take place. They created so much of what we are seeing today. And there was no one teaching civilization. You know, it was even a time where a lot of young men uh, uh, gravitated towards Islam, became Muslim in there. Some fronted, you know, and then others were sincere. But you, you, back in the, in, in the 70s and 80s, a lot of people that were incarcerated came home and changed people. They were disciplined, they were more mature, they were focused. Now instead, you know, people came home more violent, more vicious. You saw more scars on their face. It was horrible, horrible. So, so what do you think it was that, you know, uh, that brothers, you know, 70s were, you know, get, going to get more knowledge, like you said, because when you got the knowledge, right, you got it in, in God power, right, so, you know, and then they get knowledge, and, and but then somewhere along the line, like, you know, like in, 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 in institutions, they, they, they run it towards the gang life. It's, it's hard to say, you know, what happened. I'm trying to understand, because I just felt that brothers who had knowledge self had a responsibility. You know, you have to be a light in it. You could make a difference. You could end the lightness right here. Even with the ideas of the Latin kings, you know, I, I studied what they were about. You know, so if, if, if brothers were true to the organizations that they belonged in, they should have sat down and, and, and brought about some type of peace. But I think that the greed and survival, you know, you know, you see a kid come through and he got on a fresh pair of sneakers, you rob him, you know, and you know, and he's from a different culture. Because even in '74, you had a, a guy, Superman, that was he was raping dudes. Mm. You know what I mean? And, and a lot of guys got raped, so it became a point of retaliation. You know what I mean? You do this to me, I'm gonna get you back. And it's just it's just tit for tat. It goes back and forth. And there was nobody really trying to teach them. You know, nobody was upholding the teaching. It was just all about survival. Because I remember one brother who was a really good warrior brother, and and you know his cell was a mess. He says, I'm not trying to get comfortable up in here. This ain't my home. And he was a very respected brother. And he had no interest at all in being no light up in there. All he wanted to do was get, get, get out and go home and leave it alone. And a lot, I found a lot of people weren't trying to, to get involved like that. Because I, I was trying to do it. You know, I was trying to bring brothers together to build and end this. But at the end of the day, they're going to do what they're going to do. Because this is all survival. You can hear what I'm saying, and once I leave, you're going to go and do what you have to do. You're going to manipulate, because you have no control over that. You don't have no control over officer. You don't really run nothing. You're just there. You know what I mean? You, you, you have a little bit of respect. You know, you can, you can survive for a minute, but you can't control stuff that goes on behind your back. You know what I mean? There's a lot of guys that got robbed and just didn't say nothing, because they knew if they said something, they're going to feel it. You know, I remember getting people's sneakers back that, that, that got them stolen. You know what I mean? Back then, the attitude was you got to handle it. Mm -hmm. But but why y'all gotta do this for? I remember getting a lot of people's sneakers back. I can get them back for that moment, but once I leave, they're gonna take them again. Mm -hmm. Or you're gonna be deemed a snitch. You know, so it was just a horrible world, brother. You know, that, that, you know I spent 20 years in, in that atmosphere, and I'm traumatized behind it now, you know, even just speaking about it, because, you know, I just saw the destruction. You know what I mean? And how, you know, especially when the crack hit, and even now, where you're just coming on broken. You know what I mean? 
I know people who got raped in jail. They were never the same. You know, you know, dudes that were, you know, took on that savage mentality. You had to take this man hood. You know, why you had to do this for do this to this person for? You know what I mean? Just destroy him. So people don't want to talk about that, but a lot of lives are destroyed, both here in, in this city, but throughout this country, the penal institution. And I think about the innocent people who have been caught, incarcerated for crimes they didn't commit, subjected to that world. Think about racist police that, that intentionally put people in the system to destroy them because they had the power to do so. And I've, I've seen that. You know what I mean? They might just have a beef with you in the street. They don't like you. So they could just arrest you for anything. And now, next thing, you doing time for something you didn't do. And now you have to survive. I've met a lot of innocent people that did a lot of time, only to be exonerated years later. You know, one of the worst case scenarios to me that I ever heard of was this brother that was accused of killing his mother and sister mm. in Coney Island. Imagine, your mother and sister is mur uh, 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 murdered, and you the prime suspect. Now you do 20 years, 20, 20, 20 years, 25 years, only to find out that you weren't the person. So you, here you are, your mother and sister's murdered, you charged with the crime. The murderer's out there, you telling people I'm innocent, and then all these years pass, and then you find out that, that it was it was based off bullshit. You know what I mean? Based off a cop that just you know a forced testimony of a crackhead. Mm. And there was so many scenarios like that. You know, so you know that was just a part of my assignment in life. And now I look at the way the world is today. I'm devastated with all the viruses going on out there. Because you look at a lot of these seeds that are out here now. These are the grandchildren, the people I grew up with, mm. and something went wrong. You look at all the lives that have been lost in the street, the murder. You know, we look at the families that have been broken, the families, the, the seeds that went into foster care, you know, you know, the, the, those that are living in shelters. We are divided in fractures of people wounded. And I don't know what to say at this point in my life. I'm, I'm heartbroken, to be honest with you, because it's like we've gone backwards. You know, back in the days, peace was a universal greeting that meant the absence of, of confusion. And now it ain't about that no more. It ain't about calling the person a brother no more. You know what I mean? It meant something back in the days. Now people say, I ain't trying to hear that bullshit. Mm. You know, you call a woman a sister. That ain't your sister. You know, that people want to be bad bitches and niggas and all that. And that's when things change. The music changed. I often speak about the role that the music played back in the days. We grew up under the label of Philadelphia International Records. Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff, mm. Brother Luke Bond. And they produced music that had messages in it. One of, the, one of the songs that moved us back in the days was Wake Up Everybody by Harold Melvin and Blue Notes. Mm -hmm. Love is a message. You know what I mean? Backstabbers. You know, for the love of money. They, they produced music that had a message in it. And I think that that music helped to uh, inspire us over time. And we have love songs. Love songs that taught us how to love a woman. The Isley Brothers, Blue Magic, Black Ivory, you know. Those songs really inspired us, you know. We don't have that no more. I speak to a lot of young people. They know nothing about love songs. Mm -hmm. So if you're being fed a, a constant diet of sex, money, and murder, that's what you're just gonna you're gonna re reflect that. So there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done, and I, I don't know what to say no more. I've never used my cameras in this way, so I, I, I got to start doing some films. Even though I had a camcorder back in the days that I did a lot of document you know, documenting with. I, I got to my next stage now is to get into filmmaking. Well, I wanted to ask you, like, you said that you are, um, you wanted to do like a series of for for a time before crack, yeah. right? Um, are you in production with it, or are you? I think that this book is going to open up the door to make it happen. You know, okay. I'm not in production. All it is is a, is a determined idea that I have, and I feel that you know, based off the book, it just makes sense that this turns into a, a mini series. You know, and I, I have a, a, a great story to tell about the book. So I, I feel that uh, at this stage, that's the next phase of my life. I have to tell the story because I feel with the impact that Roots had on my generation, you know, a mini series, hopefully with a time before a crack, it could be used as an example to show this generation and remind my generation how life was. And I wrote a good story, a really positive story, you know, about how life was. And, some people just they debated with me. Oh, so this is like scripted kind of. Yeah, uh, it's a script. I wrote a script. I wrote, a script. I, I wrote, I wrote five okay. episodes. Oh wow. Five episodes based off my experience coming of age. It's wow. all it's all true story, actual fact. So it's not a documentary. It's a true story mm -hmm. about you know, it, it's a combination about my life and the lives of other people, 
but it's just about you know growing coming of age back in, in in the 1970s and what life was like back then and relationships you know it's it's, it's a part of it is a love story because mm. a brother meets a sister and it reminds me of a sister i met you know before i went into the military and how i met her and the type of woman that she was a refined woman and their conversation how they interact with each other but it just shows the community too you know and it deals with a wide range of issues you know i wrote one episode that's called rice and beans and that mm. whole episode is, is devoted to Latinos and, and how they existed within the projects. And it's centered in projects. I call the projects the Brooklyn Houses, you know what I mean? So it's not like a real project, but it's a project that represents Brooklyn. It's all about Brooklyn. Right, right. You know, it's a good story, you know, and it deals with Vietnam because we don't talk enough about the Vietnam War and what it was like for these guys coming home from the war. Because now you got a guy who, who, who was in heavy combat beyond what anyone could ever imagine. You know, seeing people blown to pieces and, and having to kill individuals, and now you know you back you back in America. You went in, you went to Vietnam the same year that Martin Luther King was assassinated, mm -hmm. and now when King is assassinated in Vietnam, I mean, he's assassinated. You in Vietnam, and you got folks waving the Confederate flag celebrating, and now you wondering why am I here? You know, even to speak about the fact that a, a lot of a, a lot of young men were drafted in, to go to war and put on the front lines. So we don't talk enough about that. It's very close to my heart, to, you know, in some of the most extensive research I've ever done. So one aspect of my uh, um, series is about the war in Vietnam. Mm. So a lot of it is based off my individual research, extensive research in the different things that transpired, and then based off my actual experiences, my actual encounters. My strategy was to do books first and then turn the books into movies. Because once you look at the books I've done, there's, there, there are imperfections in everything that I've done. Mm. But it's my hope that give me an opportunity to, to do it. You know, and, and I believe that I could produce something great. Gordon Parks went from doing uh, books, you know, to doing um to doing film. You know, he did the learning tree. So I want to have that same opportunity. So hopefully someone will, 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 will look at my book and say, let's do this. You know, let's make a movie called the Time Before Rack, a series. And I look at what's on Showtime, HBO, Netflix right now. There's a void. They talk about, folks is talking about doing a remix of Scarface and paid in full. I mean, really, do we need that right now? Do we need movies that are going to continue, continue to add in our destruction and movies that, that uh, present negative images of us as a people? I feel that I have a responsibility to use my voice and platform to produce, produce content that's gonna uh, inspire people, you know what I mean? And show the world another side. So a time of four crack is that. Mind you, the book is called A Time of Four Crack. Because I want people to know how life was before the crack epidemic hit. Because once crack hit, life as we knew it was forever changed. So a lot of these photographs are dealing with that time period. I mean, this is a photograph that I took in Harlem around 88. Now, now crack was, crack had hit at this point, but we still had unity. A time before COVID when people came together in the spirit of love and unity. And this is common in Harlem back in the days. One of the things I, I was exploring in, in the late 80s was spending a lot of time in Harlem. I, I, I loved it for its rich culture. You know, I was greatly inspired by the Harlem Renaissance in the early 1900s. So I loved the frequency in Harlem. It wasn't like Brooklyn. It was, it was more of a conscious vibration in Harlem back in the days. And I loved the, the, the merchants of the street. So this photograph I opened the book up with because I wanted to show the love and togetherness. And I personally don't remember any conflict around this time. You know, anybody getting stabbed, anybody getting shot. Just yesterday I heard in broad daylight around 3 o'clock they had a shooting on 125th Street. You know, so it's just something where we are going. So I, 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 I took the of the challenge to do a book called The Time Before Crack because I wanted to redress the crack epidemic and how life was. Mm -hmm. I could have easily did a book. The original idea when I came up with it back in the early 2000s was to do another book about the 80s called Strictly Old School. And it's a great title, but I wanted to be more than old school. I wanted people to think and go back to that time period. And it's, it's pretty much doing that. The book has its imperfections, but I'll look past that. This is a good brother, Trev, who lived in a neighborhood that was an official brother. You know, he was in the Marines, and, uh, and, and he lost his life. He died in a horrific car accident where he burned to death. Mm. You know, so my reason for putting this photograph in this book is to remember him. And this is my old neighborhood. This is Church Avenue right here, Church and Ralph. And, and Trev lived a few blocks away. 
know, so that was the idea of the book to remember people. How can I produce a book that's going to stimulate you and remind you? And this is the vibration in, in America at that time. You know, this is my man Malik. And he had just came home from the Marines. And you have this sign in 1982 talking about Reaganism is black genocide. Think about that. Reaganism is black genocide. This is before the crack epidemic hit. And then you have this poster showing um, South Africa, the, the Soweto massacre, where a number of South Africans were murdered by the racist South African government. So this is an important photograph here to open up the book because this is definitely a time before crack. Because crack hit pretty much in 83, 84, and here's 82, and you're saying Reaganism is black genocide. This is my man Supreme right here, and he's reading the book, The Destruction of Black Civilization. And that's my book. That's a legendary picture right there. Yes, it is. And Supreme was one of my students, and I encouraged my students to read. And I felt that to really understand the history and culture, this was a good book to read, you know, to add on to your cipher. By chance, the Williams, The Destruction of Black Civilization. Where is, where is Supreme right now? I'm not exactly sure where he's at. You know, he, he, you know he, he's out there. He reached out to me a while ago. But I really can't say where that brother's at at this point. This is a brother that passed away a few years after his photograph was taken. I believe he died in a, in a horrific motorcycle accident. So again, it was my way of honoring people who are no longer here first. Deep photograph right here. This is in my old project, Red Hook. This is a young sister that I snatched up when I first came home and we were building with. You know, good sister. And she was one of the very first casualties of crack very first ones mm. and it bothered me because I, it was a race against time with me and the drug dealers out there I'm coming back to America trying to save our people I went back out to Red Hook my old community I'm trying to save people and then you got the, the pimps the drug dealers and everybody in between snatching up the women and she's a beautiful sister as you see I'll show you a picture of her later on you'd be surprised what she looks like right now and this is a brother I grew up with Preston mm. and Preston was doing his thing out there with a lot of women and, and he died you know, so I went back with a determined idea to raise our community. You know, brothers from the neighborhood. You know, when I came home, a party. Yeah, this is a this is a party, and you know, these brothers. You know, they, you know, they, they dealt with a very interesting life. So page after page after page is is stories. You know, I would travel on the trains looking for brothers to build with. These are just young brothers I saw on the train one day, and I just I would go car to car looking for young brothers to drop the knowledge to and I came upon these brothers. So having a camera gave me access to a lot of people and I built friendships with a lot of a lot of individuals. Because you know, I'm from Medina and I would spend a lot of time at the head of Medina, a place we call Albi Square Mall, like almost every day that was the nucleus where everybody was at. This is inside the Albi Square Mall where I spent a lot of my time back Albie in the days. Yeah, so I would be here during the winter months. Really, yeah, the winter, all year round, I would go to Albany Square Mall before crack. This photograph was taken in Browns, which just shows you the frequency that somebody would even write that on the wall. So I like to pose people, you know, and, and, and kind of like tell the story. And I focus on a lot of the wisdoms too. These are sisters from Erasmus High School, and I'm friends with a lot of them to this very day. And look at them. They're slim, they have shoes on, they all have natural hair. This is common back then. So just think about how women look today versus how women were back 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 then. Very refined. So I focus a lot of my teaching on the sisters, you know, trying to encourage them to, to think very wisely in their selection of mates. I would take sisters to the park and get orange juice and, and bananas and just build them about life. You know, just brothers. This is Delancey Street where I spent a lot of my time, you know, getting my clothing, you know, so you always ran the poor brothers going shopping on the Lancaster Street. Here you got a brother with his bag here after shopping. Brother got his bags here, probably got mop necks, uh, shark skin pants back in those days. I always placed myself in places where a lot of people were at just to connect with them. So it's an interesting book. It's just an effort of mine. This is a young brother from my building. I used to babysit him, brother Tom Meek from Red Hook. And he went on to be a, you know, a serious brother back in the days brothers from the rally, you know, at a really, this is these, these, these are five percent of here. Yeah, these are gods. Are so this is, this is, this is the rally, you know. And this is what, this is, what year is this? This is like 82, 83. 82, wow. 82 83. Again, the sisters, you know, they don't have three-fourths on them, but they have shoes, no makeup on, you know. 
this is a deep picture. You know, I shared this on my social media feed uh, earlier this year, only to find out that three of these sisters have died. Oh, so wow. think about it, three of the four have died. And, uh, and I found that out by just simply posting this here. That's why I love to post on social media because it gives me insight into what happened. And this is one of my favorite places in Brooklyn. This is in Prospect Park where I spent a lot of my time at. You know, these are two sisters I call my little sisters. You know, that I took, I met in Erasmus. I took them to the park to build them, to take them away from the concrete and bring them into a more natural environment where we could just sit and we can kind of build. You know, and, and um, Aine, and I forgot my sister name. Good sister I'm still connected with right now. This brother passed away. I don't know how he died. He might, I believe he got murdered. And I knew him as a young brother. So page after page is just reflections. Again, look at the beauty of the sisters. Natural hair. You know, they have on sneakers, but the sneakers look like shoes. And they were very feminine back back then. Two biological brothers, and these this is from the tree of my enlightenment. You have Ra Sun and you have Kin Du. You know, very important photograph to put in here because I met them through my enlightenment who came from Crown Heights. You know, and I remember Ra, Ra Sun, yeah, you're, you're from uh, Ramel. And Ra Sun, you know, he went to my 11. He was a very efficient young brother back in the days with my students. You know, and we have we have a very deep history with each other. These papers are very important. These Black Panther papers that were given to me from the 1960s and 70s. Mm. So these are like plus degrees right here. Mm. And it's through these publications, you know, this is, I'm an archivist. So I try to hold on to this. There's so much information that's in these papers. You know, even science like this right here. You know, that deals with, with lynching, and, and this is 19, 1970. So these are the plus degrees that I hold on to that have really, you know, keeps me aware of what's happening, you know, and keeps me informed of, of the history. And, then, and even when Ho Chi Minh was the, the great leader of North Vietnam, and he wrote about lynching during his coming to America in the early 1900s, and, and he saw what black people were going through in terms of being lynched. So one of my partners I work with was actually a correction officer passed all these papers on to me. And these papers are very deep because Honestly. when people want to understand my, my, my relationship to the nation, when I lived in Red Hook, before I even got knowledge of self, I might have been about 12, my sister had a boyfriend that was in the nation. And um, I really admired him, he was a few years older than me. And he was a serious FOI brother and when I came home from the military, he gave me a stack of Muhammad Speaks newspapers and it blew me away that I would reconnect with this brother and he would give me all of these papers that had so much information in them. And, uh, and I thought that that brought things full circle. So it's situations like this here that has really enlightened me, you know, and this is a part of my research right now. So imagine a brother I met as a 12 year old kid and then years would pass and then he would go on to pass all these publications on to me. You know, so and I have stacks and stacks of just, you know, material. This is one of the turning points of my career right here. This is a major publication called Aperture Magazine. And uh, they feature some of my work. And what I strive to do is showcase images that tell stories of our history and culture. And this is pretty major right here, you know, to get this feature. It's kind of like a game changer for me because it helped to illuminate my career and different things I was doing. And what's interesting about this particular body of work is the fact who the writer is who, who wrote this story about me. Mm. And this is for Aperture Magazine. And Khalil Gibran Muhammad is actually the great grandson of Elijah Muhammad. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, he, um, he was uh, the director of, of um, Sean Burke. Burke. Yes, yes, yes. So he, I met him. All right, that's peace. Yeah, so yeah. Imagine, he, he's, he's uh, mm -hmm. the uh, great grandson. Mm -hmm. And he wrote this piece about my about my work in here. Wow. And um and I and look at the type of work in which I presented. Mm. So I'm just trying to illuminate the different cultures that exist. You know, and I try to honor and dignity is very important. I mean, look at these dignified women. Mm. You know, brotherly love. This is one of my most important photographs right here. We must first be brothers. So to, to capture brothers shaking hands is very important to me to show that love. And here you have brothers from two different cultures coming together in the spirit of unity mm -hmm. you know the hampton university band you know this is a photograph i took in harlem called remembering malcolm you know sisterhood is very important to me um, there's so much and i'll show you some work here one of the portfolios 
this photograph, I needed to find a way to address gang violence in our community in the schools because I was in, being invited to a lot of schools to teach and I knew I had to reach the gang. So I came up with this idea here to have a created chessboard, red and black. The red representing the blood that has been spilt already in both pieces of black. So in the game of chess, in order to play, you have to have colors that are contrast to each other. But here you have black pieces. That means that no one can move. So here you have one represents a young man representing the blue, the Crips, and you have a young man representing the Bloods, and they're at war with each other. I call it what now? Because mm -hmm. now you can't do anything. So when I teach, you know, this picture comes up, so I get the attention of a lot of young brothers, you know, when they see images of that nature. This is a really powerful photograph right here taken in the, in the, in the court system, and this is a lawyer visiting his, his client. This is a cell that I put a lot of people in over the years you know, uh, a cell that will gain them entry into the world. So it has a lot of history. Gil Scott Heron was in this cell right here. One of the most devastating uh, experiences in my time in corrections when he fell victim to the system due to his addiction. And he came to my area and I was trying to build with the brother, but he seemed like he was really gone. Mm -hmm. You know, but a lot of good brothers I would put in this cell and build with, you know, rather than being the largest cells that were packed. This is not solitary or? No, this is not solitary. This is this court. They, this is a waiting a wait court right here. Oh, okay. So this is like a, a, a very solitude pen that, you know, there's other cells that are jam-packed, but I will put certain people in the cell here to read, to pray, to use the bathroom, just to reflect. It was a cell that only occupied really by two people, where the other cells were about 30 people. And I try to contrast, you know, you have a you know situation here, a person outside, talking to somebody inside, and you have the sister here in the inside, you know, in the doorway. So, I, you know, this is just a part of my visual storytelling. Mm. I shoot in both black and white in color. Now, do you have a lot of uh, photographs of like graffiti, the time of, uh, from graffiti? Not really. I shot it indirectly on the train. I didn't, I didn't shoot graffiti per se, but I documented, you know, people on the train when you see the graffiti, graffiti. in the background. Okay. I thought it would, it would be around forever, so I never really focused a lot on graffiti because mm. I just never thought it would fade away. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. So the documentation of the nation, of all the nations, is important to me. So these are old timers from the first resurrection in the nation. These are two sisters that used to be Earths right here, Shaquan Asia and, and, and Sister um, Shanasia. Shaquan Asia and Shanasia. They were both Earths in the nation, dynamic Earths. Mm. You know, Shaquan Asia. Both of them are my dear sisters. Just a little bit, you know. My trip to Ethiopia was one of the greatest wow. experiences of my life. Okay. To travel to Ethiopia and document the culture, and again the Rastafarian sisters. You know, mm -hmm. you know, love is always an important element of my work. You know, documenting couples. I got, I got endless work. You know, I just gotta get rid of it right now. Everything gotta go. You say gotta go. Like what? Do you, what do you, museums, what do you, museums, and institutions, because it's just so much work that I've okay. had to document over the many years. So I don't really need it right now. You so know? What, what is your what is your process to getting them into uh, museums and institutions? Just really reaching out to. Re one of the strategies is my social media feed. You know, because a lot of the institutions follow me, so they reach out to me. And when I do shows, you know, when they want to do ex exhibitions with me, I let them know the work is available after the show's over, and they really appreciate that. But I reach out to museums and universities and I just, you know, I showcase my work and let them know I'm trying to find homes for it right now. Mm. So that's very important to me because I have it. But what's the point in having it when it could be shared? Okay. You know, so all this work to me, you know, I, I've been blessed to document it. Now I don't need it anymore. You know, once mm. it goes in the book, I really don't need it no more. It needs to go out. Oh, wow. And that's very important to me, you know, because I do this for the people, you know. And I have thousands upon thousands of images. This is a very important photograph because like I shared with you before, you know, this brother's gone and that brother's gone. Mm. You know, so it means a lot to their families now that have froze this moment in time for future generations to see. I, again, I try to tell stories, you know, to juxtapose these images together. You know, here you have this young white kid, triple five soul shirt, shirt on behind the American flag. And when I make images, I try to create images to tell stories. I knew that when I took this photograph that these two would go well with each other. They will flow well to help tell the story. Mm. This is a part of my street portrait series. This is all film. Mm. And this is a really interesting photograph right here. This things that you see in your travels. 
here you have um, Amos, Amos Jid, and you have you know Little Kim or Foxy Brown, and just think you have this disrespect wow. right next to Amos, and then you have a Muslim sister walking by, and Muslim sisters looking outward. So it's the point of carrying your camera everywhere you go and just seeing. My camera's always out. Mm-hmm. This is MGT Vanguard drilling that Savior's Day. You know, very powerful photograph of my sister's from Moss number seven. I mean, were you commissioned to go in there to, to do that? No, or you just, no, you just I, went I, in there. I, I, just, I, just, well, I just went. You know, I traveled to Chicago with the idea of documenting the nation. Mm-hmm. It was very important to me. Mm-hmm. You know, just brothers, you know, the, the rally, you know, back the in the rally. days. What year was this? It's probably like 83, 84. Forty mm. Second Street back in the days, you know, just always traveling. You know, eighty three, eighty four as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. In the nation again. This is Savior's Day, so I use it as an opportunity to just document. You know, this this very important part of my journey. I just want to continue. I was greatly inspired by Muhammad Ali back in the days. I want to know more about the nation and looking at the, to me the pictures was incredible. So to have an opportunity to build up a body of work on it was very important to me to continue in that tradition. You know, Mr. Farrakhan's daughter. Mm. This is at uh, this is Chicago, Chicago again. This is about the drill. This is at Moss Number Seven here. Family. This is at Chicago. This is about the drill. So, so it's a very important body in my work, like all my work. You know, all of it is very important to me. Right, that's one of the book. Yeah, you know. This one. How how did you catch this right here? Like this, it was just really timing. Just timing. This, this is about timing and always being prepared because it's raining outside. You see, the street is wet. And um, I had my camera out ready, and I, I was led to the situation. My camera was out; it was it was properly uh, set with the shutter and aperture, and I followed all of my father's instructions, and I was able to capture this moment. What's so powerful about this photograph? I have a relationship right now with my dog, just like that. I, mm. I have a pit just like that, and we roll just like that. I would have never imagine mm. that some forty years later, this would be me today. You know, with the door, this would be one of my most iconic photographs. Yeah, and what it represents is, is, is like composition and speed mm. and light. You know, so all because photography is a science, it's light and speed. So, in order to get it, you got to understand those sciences and bring them together. And that's allowed me to capture this particular photograph right here, which I have two. I actually got three versions of it. Mm. So, things that you see this is on a crowded street in Lower Manhattan. And, I, and I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was packed on Broadway. And here you have a dog looking at a sign that says, no dogs allowed. Mm. This hall of things that you see. Mm. Some advertisement wow. I did, you know, this is for Pro Kids. And this is for a company called Umbro, you know, in the train station. Mm. So I, I use the city streets. Jacob the jeweler. Guardian angels there, you know, and then the despair. Mm. This is a powerful photograph right here. This is what I learned about photography, to create images to tell stories. You have this individual, you know, out, knocked out. You have a sign that says, if it concerns you, it concerns us. Light skin and black bitches are sucks. Somebody just wrote this. And you mm. got more than sickness. And you got a Keith Herring piece right here. who are going to be this legendary artist, which I didn't even know at that time. So now this picture becomes valuable. Mm. You know, inside the bullpen shot with a wide angle lens. This is a mental health unit in the courts. So a lot of the mentally ill who are going to see the judge are going to see a psychiatrist, they are placed inside this pen. And it's it's, it's insane because you have all these different uh, aspects of mental illness confined in one cell area. You know, this picture just happened to be one, but any given occasion, there's at least 20 people inside the cell with different forms of mental illness. And again, Photographs of, of the sisters out there on the street. You know, playing around with the idea right here, you know, going against the grain of what I normally do. I call this Ghostbusters, but you have this renowned artist painted this, and now you got a brother with his girl with his toolie out aiming. Mm. Yeah, this is a powerful photograph right here. You know, this is timing. This is at the Veterans Day parade. Here you have these young. ROTC kids, junior ROTC, and you have this the, the senior ROTC kid, and they all looking up to him. I call this one looking to the future. This is at 106 in Park, the graffiti park. We just talking about graffiti, and these are two renowned artists here. I know this is Sign, I don't know his name. 42nd Street back in the days.
I spent a lot of time out there in the 80s just documenting that culture. Mm. It's a powerful picture. You know, this is what led me here it was really interesting. I just happened to see them building pretty much just like that. And then something told me to engage them in conversation. And when I did, I found out these are all veterans. Mm. She was in the Marines. He was in the Army. And she was in the Navy, I believe. They were all veterans. And they were friends. And I call this the new face of war. Because you would see this photograph and just assume they're just regular people. Not realizing these are all veterans. Mm. Of three different branches of the military. Mm. And just, you know caption images to tell the story the photograph him by himself is one thing but now when you include all these different elements in here it gives greater depth to the photograph mm -hmm. you know you have a march for Mumir in Philly south the war in Iran Malcolm X brother standing in the square you know so there's a lot going on but like I said by himself is one thing but now to put him in here his shirt blends with the yellow it helps to tell a deeper story same mm -hmm. with this photograph right here you have police officers. This is a very rare picture because it ain't often you see police like this here. Mm. This is at the Mean Youth March. And I happened to see them then. I wanted wow. to show cops in, a, in, a, in another How light. I was there. I said, you know. Yeah. And you hear we have a sign that says, we love our youth. And you have police officers. You're all officers of color. So it's just trying to tell the story, you know, with the camera. Mm. You know, documentation on the train. Different things that you see. My man, Luis Mendez, you know, good rolling partner of mine. Just a good associate over the many years. Mm. And this is a classic photograph of a brother who's a follower at that time of Silas Muhammad. And here you have a paper that says Muslims speak on unity. And he's holding up the tradition of Malcolm and saved the black family. So things that you see and you capture. Mm -hmm. This is an interesting photograph here because I have posed pictures and unposed. This is Coney Allen, and I call the four degrees of separation. So sometimes titles are important for me to have to go along with my photographs to tell a deeper story. So you have four different people from four different situations in the time before cell phones, and they're all, you know, separated by a booth. Mm -hmm. And now these phones don't exist anymore. So this right. becomes a very iconic, yeah. classic photograph. This is a historic picture right now. You know, legendary Kid Freeze, B-Boy, and wow. Lucky Strike, you know, a renowned brother in the hip-hop industry. He has since passed away. Mm -hmm. And now this goes on to be a very important photograph. You know, it's a lot of elements here. You got the boombox, you got two individuals, Latinos, and you got the graffiti in the background. I like this synth mega. Do it again. Do it again.